Good morning. Would you stand with us in worship? worship our king come let us bow at his feet oh he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes oh he has done great things he has done great things
And so uh, for these next two songs, um, you guys can be seated if you want to. Uh, but uh, this, this time is open for you. I want you guys to feel free to respond in the way that you, you feel led. So if that means standing up and raising your hands when everyone else is sitting, go for it. But you can have a seat if you would like for these next two songs. <laughs> most of you know, uh, we had our missions conference yesterday, which was awesome. And uh, just one of the main things I left with was just, and it was cool because we prayed about this, but um, I left with just a renewed vision uh, of God's heart for the world. Um, and that was a huge blessing and an encouragement and a challenge to me. And I've been reading in Ephesians where it says that God illumines the eyes of our heart to see him in his glory. And that idea of glory is, is seeing the, the essence of who God is and his character. And it was just a beautiful thing to be reminded of God's heart to heal and redeem the world. That's what we're about. 
And I was like, this is something cool to get excited about. So I feel this next song really just illuminates that and expresses that um, in, in a beautiful way. Lord, uh, we ask that as we sing this next song, uh, that you would continue to reveal your character to us in your heart for the broken and the struggling and the hurting. Um, Lord, and help us to see that we're called to be a part of your mission to redeem the world. And Lord, that we would take that seriously this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. You came and loved the least of these, the leper and the lame. And it would be a tragedy to refuse to do the same. On my knees, you have supplied. When I was dead, you gave me life. And how could I not? and give it away so freely and i'll follow you into the homes that are broken follow you into the world meet the needs for the poor We have one more. For those of you who are seated, you guys can be standing for this last one.
and have a seat. I just want to welcome all of you to Grace Bible Church. Some of you are visiting here for the first time. We're grateful you are here today. My name is Pastor Adam Waters. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Bible Church, and we have a wonderful community here that represents Christ, who loves one another well, and who is a heart for mission. This is our annual missions conference Sunday. If you were here yesterday, you know the amazing time that we had learning about what it means to be reaching the nations right here at our door. Uh, We have opportunities for you to get plugged into small groups, get plugged into ways you can give, get plugged into ways you can serve at our website, gbcelm.org, and I'd encourage all of you when you get a chance to do that. Speaking of ministry, you'll notice behind the backs of the pews and the seats in front of you, there's a QR code. If you are interested today in worshiping the Lord in this way, we thank you for your gifts and that know that that money goes a long way in reaching people for Christ, reaching the nations who are at our doors. Uh, just by way of a little bit of an announcement, next week we have our annual or semi-annual business meeting, October 29th. It's immediately after the service. 
There will be childcare provided, so if you have kids, feel free to stay. In fact, we encourage you to stay. If you are not yet a member, we encourage you to stay. While you won't be able to vote on the motions, you will be able to hear about what God is doing here at the best kept secret in Elmhurst, (laughs) Grace Bible Church. So we have the wonderful opportunity to go before the Lord together as a family in prayer. So let's take that time right now to quiet our souls, quiet our hearts, as we put ourselves in the presence of our Almighty Father. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity with fresh mercy and fresh grace. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us today to worship you, to proclaim your name. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness that you shed upon us through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our behalf. We admit, Lord, that we are not worthy. We admit, Lord, that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, nor ever could do. And Lord, by your grace and goodness, you came to us, you made a way for us, and you called us into your kingdom because of what Christ has done, settling our sin debt. We pray, Father, that you would bless our families. It's so hard raising families. We, Lord, half the time we don't know if we're making right decisions or not. But Lord, help us to first and foremost to place our trust in you, to look to you, to parent our children and our grandchildren the way, Lord, that you love us as a good and gracious father. We pray, Father, for the other families other than Grace Bible Church that are scattered around your world, congregations of people, Lord, who we are united with through your spirit. We pray for them, Lord. Lord, we pray if they are not proclaiming the pure gospel, Lord, that you would move them to repentance and to declare the truth to the nations. Lord, if they are faithful to your word, we give you praise that your name is ringing out. We pray, Lord, for this church, and we ask that you would bless Grace Bible Church, that you would move us, your people, and transform our hearts, that we would be a light to the nations, that we would be ready to show hospitality to the way it has been shown to us. We pray, Father, that you would be here, that this service would be a delight to you, and that the words we speak, Lord, would glorify you. And we do all of this to that end, your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. For those of you who were here yesterday, you're going to see Rich Mendola again. For those who weren't, you should have been here yesterday. He was quite the speaker. And he's going to give us a little more today. He's going to talk to us about biblical hospitality and what it means to reach international students right here at home. So Rich, come on up. So grateful for you, brother. Thank you. Wow, so glad to be with you. I want to share with you four powerful reasons why everyone here should consider being a friend of an international student. In fact, everyone in Elmhurst who's a Christian, everyone in Chicago who's a Christian, this is for everyone. So the first reason, let me get my PowerPoint going here. Okay. Uh Aha. Okay, let's go ahead and advance it there. You can advance it for me. There we go. Let me see if this is going to work now. Uh, you, okay. So first reason. Next slide. The first reason is that it is biblical. You know, when we trace God's plan to bless all the nations of the earth, he began by looking for one person who was willing to move to another place. International is someone who leaves their family, their friends, their culture, and goes to another place. And so Abram, who became Abraham, was willing to do that, and God gave him that great promise that through him all the nations would be blessed. And then if you continue in redemptive history, and you see how God sent Joseph as an international to Egypt. Now, I know it was, he was, brothers were involved, but Psalm says he was sent by the Lord. And he was there to save his generation. And then you think about Moses. Moses was born in Egypt, but he left, and then God sent him back. You think about Ruth who was willing to leave her home and her, and her country and go to the place God was leading her, and she was incorporated into the lineage of Christ. There's just the Old Testament is full of these stories 
but the New Testament as well. The book of Acts is really an account of God reaching people away from home through the spread and the gospel spreading that way. When you think about the day of Pentecost, how God had assembled all the nations there in Jerusalem, and the church was born in that setting so that people could be released back into the nations. You think about a man from Ethiopia in Acts chapter 8 who traveled a long way from home and then heard the gospel and returned home. This was the way the gospel first got to Africa. And then you think about the group of people that I work with, international students. And there is the international student in the book of Acts. Who is that? It's the person who left his home in Tarsus to study in Jerusalem under the Jewish teacher Gamaliel and there on the Damascus Road became a Christian. Yes, Paul was a former international student who was reached away from home. And you think about Cornelius, the soldier, who's a Roman soldier stationed away from Rome in Caesarea, and God sends Peter to him, and the gospel begins to break forth into a whole new area of the world. And then the first Asian Christian mentioned in the Bible by name, she is away from her home in Thyatira, and she's living in Philippi when she meets Paul, and God opened her heart, and the church became meeting in her home there. Wow, powerful stories of God working his purpose, his redemptive purpose to spread the gospel, to bless every nation through people who are away from home. And so this is God's continuing plan today. So let's say that together, this word. I'm going to give you the four, reason you want, four words I want you to hold on to. The first one, it is biblical. biblical. Okay, all right, you got it. So let's go on to the next one. It is strategic. You know, those names that I mentioned to you from the Old Testament and the New Testament, how many of them were in leadership positions? Many. You see Joseph raised up as a ruler, Moses, who became the leader of the nation, and Nehemiah, who I didn't mention. Many leaders. And the fact is that international students are the future leaders of the world. In fact, today, let's go to the next slide, here's just a picture of some of the current and former leaders from Kenya and Colombia and from Taiwan and other places that are heads of state that were once international students in the United States. And, and this is critical to the future of nations, that if there's godly leaders in education and in science and in business and in government, that will affect the course of nations. And right now, we have the opportunity to influence the future leaders of nations. So the, this, the second th reason, well, let me give you a little case study, a case study just on China. You know, China it right now is very close to foreign missionaries. Uh, there's an oppression going on among Christians. But in, in history, it's very interesting. When China began to open up, let's show the next slide, this uh, Deng Xiaoping was the, oh, I'll, I'll come back to him. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was the president of China. And it was very difficult for the gospel at that point to get into China because of the communist rule. And yet, I found out that his son was studying in the United States, near where I was living. And so we sent a messenger to bring the gospel to that son, hoping that he could go back and tell his father about the gospel. Uh, he didn't receive Christ, but it was an opportunity. I think about the current president of China, Xi Jinping. Uh, he came to the United States uh, to study agriculture. He stayed with the host family. I don't know if he heard the gospel, but then I found out that his son, his, I'm sorry, his daughter just recently was studying in the United States as an international student. Can you imagine if his daughter could have heard the gospel and brought it back to tell her father in China, this is good news. This is good news for you. This is good news for China. Let's go on to the next slide. This, this is a fellow who studied at the Ohio State University as an international student, brilliant student, got his PhD in three years, but had a conversion experience and had a burning passion to go back and share the gospel in China. When he went back to China, there were not many Christians, but God used him to lead 100,000 Chinese to Christ. In fact, at the time of his death, there were one million Chinese Christians, so 10% of Chinese Christians became Christians through his ministry. Very powerful to see how God can affect nations through returning international students. But that's not the only reason. So it's strategic because we're seeing future leaders. But let me tell you the second reason why it's strategic. Let's go ahead three slides. I'm gonna, if you can advance three. Uh, oh, okay, I'll stop here for a moment. <laughs> I forgot to tell you about another friend of mine who was an atheist from China, and, and he heard the gospel 
And after he heard the gospel, he wanted to share it with his countrymen. And so he, he wrote, um, he, he, he retranslated the Bible into modern Chinese. And this, this has been his life work. These are three of the volumes that he's produced. He's almost completed the whole Bible translated into Chinese. Very powerful. Let's go to the next slide. Another friend of mine. Um, well, this is, this is not my friend. This is the old president of China. Let's go past him. Go, go, go. Keep going. Keep going. That's the current one. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. <laughs> okay, here we go. Second, go back. Uh, second strategic reason. This is a map of what are called unreached people groups. Those are uh, peoples who with the common language and culture where less than 2% of the people are Christians. There's no reproducing church. That means that most people in those uh, groups never get to hear about Jesus Christ. And the red dots represent those unreached people groups. Can you see where the greatest concentration is? It is India. India has the largest number of unreached people groups. What is the group of people that is coming in increasing numbers as international student? Indian students. Uh, there's, the Chinese are still the largest, but Indians are the second. And it's amazing opportunity God has given to us to reach groups of people that when they were in their country had no opportunity to hear the gospel. Let's go on to the next slide. This is my friend Mohit. Mohit comes from the north part of India, a state called Rajasthan, one of the least evangelized parts of India. And he comes from a people group called the Kati people. And when I asked him and he told me that, I went back and looked up in a place called the Joshua Project that has a catalog of all the unreached people groups of the earth. And I put in Kati people of, of India. And there it popped up. 1.6 million Kati people, 0.00% Christians. And here was Mohit coming to study in the United States, and he was open to my friendship, and he was open to the gospel, and I began to be his friend and began to share Christ with him, and Mohit has begun to follow Christ. And right now he's preparing himself, and I'm discipling him to go back to India to share the gospel. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that strategic? So international student ministry is number one, Biblical. Okay, let's try it again. It is what? Biblical. Biblical. Number two? Strategic. Okay, you're getting it. All right. We're doing well here. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the third reason. The third, next slide. It is effective. Now, why? I've told you these stories about these people having these tremendous impacts in the world. Why is that? It's because they already know the language. They know the culture. They are able to return without a visa. They, they're they are able to be relationally connected. They are respected in their culture. So they have all the things that make it difficult for missionaries who have to do culture study, language study, have to raise support, all of that, and they don't have those barriers. Let me give you one example of the effectiveness. The, one of the largest unreached people groups in the world are Japanese people. There's very few Japanese Christians. Let's show the next slide. And I met this guy here named Toshi years ago, came to study. He had never met a Christian in his country, never even had seen a church. He came from a place of 100,000 people in Japan, almost no Christians there. He came to the United States to study, and uh, we showed the Jesus film at Easter in different languages, and, he, and one of the, the languages was Japanese. And he decided, let me go and find out what this is about. And he went, and, and as a result of that, he began to study the Bible together, and Toshi became a Christian. Now he said, oh, I need to go back to Japan and share Christ with Japanese people. And, and he got his teaching English as a second language degree, went back and began to offer tutoring lessons in English to Japanese at a low cost. And everybody wanted to take lessons from him. And he did that so he could share the gospel with them. And so he would share the gospel. People would become Christians. He would form them into small cell groups and teach them, train them, and then he would do that again and again. And when this picture was taken, he had already started 70 house churches in Japan. An amazing impact. He was so effective because he could share freely in Japan. Oh, brothers and sisters, God has given us such an opportunity to bless the nations through international students. It is biblical. It is strategic. And it is effective. And let me give you one more. Okay? Last one. Next slide. It is economical. Why do I say that? You know, if you were to send uh, right now a missionary couple to go to Japan, the cost would be $100,000 a year. That is a lot of money. Toshi went back, self-supporting, 
uh, just needed prayer support and encouragement. And, and the reality is, in this day and age, the cost related to sending out missionaries has increased. Elmhurst could be, with Elmhurst College and Chicago, with all the colleges here, could be one of the greatest missionary sending outposts in the United States if international students came here, were befriended by American Christians, were trained to go back, and were released among the nations, there would be so much blessing that we'd be shared among the nations. Uh, I, I, I'm going to stop. Because <laughs> I've given you four powerful reasons. I would have given you ten, but I only had ten minutes. Okay? <laughs> so many of you received a passport. And when you get a passport, you usually think about going to another country. But this is a unique passport. This passport brings 100 nations to you because this is the way that you can show your interest in international student ministry. If you didn't get one, there's a display table out there. But I wanted to make it easy for you to respond. I want you to prayerfully consider being a friend to an international student. Uh, Nick and Allison Miller are here. They live in this area. They are the IFI representatives that are going to help this church connect with international students. I'm not asking you to go out and find them. I'm asking you, would you be willing to be a friend to an international student? Would you be willing to have a meal with them? Would you be willing to practice, have them practice their English with you? Would you be willing to take them out shopping? Would you take them apple picking? Would you help them build a snowman for the first time in their life? If you're open to that, could you fill this out today? and give it at the table on the way out. And I'd love to talk to you further. But I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do through this church in blessing the world that has come to us. God bless you. The kid's gone already? That it looks too full for the kids to be gone already, but God has blessed us today. Rich, thank you so much. That was awesome. I'll never forget the acronym BEAT. B-E-E-T now. BEAT. Biblical, economical, effective. Oh, B's. Strategic. I can't spell. <laughs> B's. Theologians often talk about the three offices of Christ. Maybe you're familiar with that. On the one hand, we'll say, or one of those offices, we'll say that, that Christ came as a priest unto God, a go-between, a mediator between mankind and God. We will say not only that, Christ came as a king, and that he comes to rule his creation. We talk about him as a prophet. The prophet that was foretold by Moses, that one would come after me who is greater than me, the great prophet Christ. That is the image of God in the person whom we follow, the second Adam. Remember, the first Adam was placed in the garden and giving these responsibilities as well. How did that go? First Adam messed it up for all of us. The second Adam came and fulfilled that image perfectly in himself. Now, that begs a question. If Christ is fulfilling the reflection of God, the Imago Dei, perfectly to mankind and showing us what it means to be made in the image of God, and he shows it as a king, and he shows it as a priest, he shows it as a prophet, then we too should be fulfilling all three of those roles in some way in our lives. Consider this. First is a priest. The scripture says that we are priests and priestesses unto God. That we stand between mankind as a whole and as his amb God's ambassadors to him. Genesis 1.26 says that we, were to be, that we were made in the image of God and we were placed in creation to reflect God and take dominion and control. That's our kingly role, our royal role. But have you ever considered yourself a prophet? Because that too is part of the role of you fulfilling and imaging God, representing God here on earth. As believers, we are prophets of God and are called to declare the things of God, the gospel of God to the nations, wherever they might be. Now, 
Maybe you've never thought of yourself as a prophet. Maybe when we think of prophet, we think of somebody standing on the corner in downtown Chicago declaring fire and brimstone to all who walk by. Or maybe you think of prophet and you think of John the Baptist. I don't want to wear burlap and eat bugs. That's not going to work. But the scripture overwhelmingly declares that you were made to speak the truth of God, to live the truth of God, and so declare the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to the nations all around us. They're everywhere. No longer do we have to go thousands of miles. They are right here. Now, if you don't realize this, if you don't see what God is calling you to, you might shrink away from speaking the next time you have the opportunity. You might miss out on seeing God work a miracle through you because every life that's saved, every soul that's saved is a miracle of God's supernatural goodness. Don't you want to see that? We hear the stories of Rich talking about these internationals who come one religion and they leave Christ followers. That excites me. I don't know about you. Like That makes me want to speak. That makes me want to love the way Christ loved. That I too would see these miracles right before my eyes. If we don't deal with this, if we don't understand that we have a prophetic mission, that part of our role here on earth is to be prophets of God, we'll miss out on a huge portion of what we were made for, of what we were created for. So today we're going to look at one of God's most famous prophets and his calling, Jeremiah. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10. What we're going to read today is the actual calling of Jeremiah. His calling parallels our own calling as Christ followers in a lot of ways. Now, this calling doesn't demonstrate that necessarily we are called to be a prophet like Jeremiah or in the order of Jeremiah. God is not calling us to walk around for years naked. God is not calling us to go necessarily to the rulers of nations, of foreign nations, and declare their condemnation and enjoin their repentance. But if we see the pattern here, we'll recognize it in our own life as we look to the New Testament. And we see that God is calling us to, to be prophets of God to the nations. So verse 4, let's start there. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You see, before Jeremiah was ever born, before he was ever a twinkle in his father's eye, God had a plan and a mission for his life. God knew Jeremiah specifically would be a prophet to prophesy over the land of Judah. That he would be called to call Judah back to covenant obedience. See, God made a promise. If you do these things, I will bless you. If you don't do these things, there will be consequences. Come back to the covenant and I will bless you. Judah or or Jeremiah constantly was calling Judah back to repentance, back to obedience. Not only that, God knew that Jeremiah one day would prophesy to the surrounding nations, to Egypt and the Philistines, Moab and Ammon, Damascus, Elam, and Babylon. Now, if you know anything about Jeremiah's ministry, it was not easy. He was beaten and put in jail. He was told to walk around, as I said, naked. As a demonstration to the nation of Israel about their own brokenness, He's called the weeping prophet because we find that Judah didn't listen. That ultimately Judah was conquered by Babylon and the Jews were taken away in exile. But Jeremiah was set apart from eternity to step into that mission in his day and age. It is not an accident, brothers and sisters, that you were born here in this place, in this time, that you were brought here to this place in this time. Whether you were born internationally, whether you were born right here at Elmhurst Hospital, it is not an accident. You ever played that game where people say, if you could have lived at any time, when would it be? Back in the day, I would have said the 60s. Back in the day, that was my time, back in the 60s. The best time for you to be living is now. 
that God has called you and ordained you to live now. It should be no surprise that you are who you are, living in the context in which you live, because God has brought you to this day now for a purpose. Because you have a God-ordained prophetic mission to reach the nations. Sounds scary when you put it like that. A God-ordained prophetic mission. That means God has called you and known you and consecrated you by name to be here at this time in this place that you would declare the things of God to the nations. That you would love like Christ. That others would see his glory in you. Like Jeremiah, God knew you and loved you before you were born. In fact, you were known and loved and chosen from eternity past to be conformed to the image of Christ. Think of that. That before anything existed, that God knew you and loved you. That God knew that you would be pulled, called into his kingdom to reflect the glory of Christ around you. Our lives are not nothing. Our lives are not just one and done. Our lives are rooted in eternity, past and future, and they matter. When we look at Adam and Eve created in the garden, they were made to reflect God by serving as God's representatives to all of creation, to take dominion and to conquer, to be fruitful and to multiply. We see Israel, God pulling from one man, Abraham, creating a nation that that nation would reflect and be a prophet to the nations. Israel being created to reflect the glory of God to the nations of the world. Isaiah 49.3 says, And he said to me, this is God, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. God created Israel to glorify him. Like us, before our salvation and sadly many times thereafter, they failed. And so Christ came. Christ came to fulfill the mandate of God for all of humanity. To reflect the image of God. To be that prophet who was to come. To declare the truths of God. Never have we heard a man speak like this. And he calls us to carry that mission forward. By faith and the power of the Spirit, we are being conformed to the image of Christ. Part, an integral part of that image is the prophetic part, to declare the truths of God. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. He's sending, I've shown you, now go do what I've done. He says, do not fear. He says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You do not go alone. We make disciples of all nations no matter where they are, overseas or here at our very door. We see the inception of Jesus' command really in Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. As the disciples were praying, as the apostles were praying, the Spirit of God rushed upon them. And as Jesus told them to go and make disciples, to declare the truth of the gospel. So they were moved out during this holiday season of Pentecost, where it says Jews and people of every nation, tribe, and tongue were assembled. And as they went out, they declared the things of the Lord in languages that those who heard could understand, their own language. A mighty and miraculous working of God and using his people to declare the gospel to the nations of the world. Do you realize that our church, GBC, that we right here are part of a broader movement of God throughout the world? What? To bring forth the truth as a bulkhead in the battle against evil. Well, I'm, I, I'm not a prophet. Simply live like a Christian and it happens. Keep your eyes on Christ, looking to him, and it just comes out. Be willing and obedient to go outside of your comfort zone and watch what God will do through you. 
2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. God is making an appeal. He's begging you. He's begging the people to whom you speak. He's begging to mankind, please receive the forgiveness that I offer in Jesus Christ. It's incumbent upon us to declare that message. Our eternal mission can be overwhelming if it's not understood with the right heart. I mean, I hear things like this or riffs like this all the time. And maybe people don't say it specifically like this, but the heart is here. Well, I mean, I'm glad I'm saved, but don't ask me to talk to anybody. I know I was a sinner. I know that I was saved by grace. I know everything you say to be true, but I, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I don't want to talk. It's like saying I got a brand new car, but I don't want to drive it. Or maybe, well, not everyone's an evangelist. Not everyone's a prophet. Not everyone is called to speak. That is wrong. Not everyone is an evangelist, but everyone is called to evangelize, and there's a difference. Some people are gifted supernaturally in a way that it comes easy, and it just comes out, and God uses them in powerful ways. When you look at the New Testament overall, when you look at the breadth of Scripture overall, it's clear we are to speak. We are to love and show forth Christ's glory in the way that we deal with people. You might say, I have a hard enough time dealing with my own struggles in life. I am in no position to be preaching anything to anyone. Let me challenge you. The struggles with which you deal in this life are the very reason you are qualified to declare what God has done in you. The very painful circumstances you've been through, the very sinful life that God has forgiven you from opens the door for those to give, to hear the message through you. There's nothing like the gospel declared with humility. And there's nothing like a struggle in life to give you some of that. We could all use a little bit of that. It's amazing how God uses our service to others to give joy and perspective on our own lives. All of these view preaching and evangelism, what I'm asking, what I'm calling you, what I'm saying you are prophets, as tasks. But family, these are privileges. These are tremendous blessings. Our mission is an expression of God's love within us. If we struggle to evangelize, if we struggle to speak the things of the Lord, if we struggle to make friends with an end towards showing them the glory of God, it's not an issue of we don't know what to say or we don't, it's a hard issue and it demonstrates, honestly, a problem with our relationship with the Lord. I recognize within me, I'm sure you do too, that when I'm far from the Lord, the last thing I want to do is evangelize. But in those moments where I'm starting to really understand God's love for me, those moments that I feel, what is it that I have? I have to say something. So perhaps the answer to, I don't want to share, I don't want to talk, I don't know what to say, is not to learn how to share, talk, and say, but it's to learn about Christ's love for you and to be willing to have God move anything out of the way that prevents you from embracing that. I mean, look, God tells Jeremiah, I knew you. That's not just I knew your identity. He's saying, I loved you from eternity past. Do you realize, friends, God has loved you from eternity past? Knowing your whole life, the whole sweep of every failure, every trauma, every issue, yet he called you. He saved you by his grace. Oh, He says to Jeremiah, I consecrated you. That means I made you holy and set you aside. In the Old Testament, you read about the tabernacle being built and the temple being built, and there were implements for the, the functioning of the temple made of gold and bronze and silver, and they were set aside for holy uses. There were regular tongs and there were holy tongs. There were regular plates, there were holy plates. You, like those implements in the temple, are God's holy and perfect, consecrated and set aside for special use instruments. 
of his glory, of his goodness to the nations. We partner with God in his mission to glorify himself through Christ. But it's so easy to see it as all on us, right? We're like, oh my gosh, I got to go up to someone and talk to them about Jesus. And I got to, you know, it's like always be selling or always be closing, like the ABCs of sales, right? Always be. The second I talk to them, I got to get them to a decision. Got to get them to a decision. Maybe God is simply asking you to love them like Jesus, to speak the natural truths that God is moving through you as you let him and to let the results be on him. Like Jeremiah, though, if you're feeling like evading this calling, I don't blame you, nor does Jeremiah, because he tried to do it. Look at verse 6. Then I said, "Uh, Lord, behold, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you declares the Lord. Jeremiah, like many of us, will say, well, I'm not prepared. I, I, this is so sudden. I, I I'm too young. I don't know what to say. We hear it with Moses. I can't speak right either. He said the same thing. I don't know enough. People won't respect me. I lack credibility. We make excuses, don't we? It's the wrong season in my life. When the kids go to high school, well, it probably started when the kids go to school. Then it's when the kids go to high school. Then when they were empty nesters. Then it's when I retire. Then it's when there's never going to be a good time. The time is now. The riot, the fields are ripe for harvest. All of these usually boil down to one thing. Fear. And God, God knows this. Because when Jeremiah says, I'm too young, God answers with, do not be afraid. Our biggest hindrance is fear. But God says, I will be with you to deliver you. That means when we step into this prophetic mission, when we step into an opportunity, when we find the courage to declare the things of God out of the overflow of God's love within our hearts, that God makes himself accountable for the outcome and that God promises to deliver you. We can trust God's power. In fact, we're called to trust God's power, not your prowess in living out your God-ordained prophetic mission. It's not about how good you are, how smart you are, how well you can talk. It's none of that. It's God's power. Jeremiah's excuses or his lack of competence in youth were simply covers for underlying fears. How many of us have said, I just don't know what to say? What if they ask a question I don't know the answer to? I'm already late for an appointment. I don't have time to talk to this person. Or maybe they know me from my old life. They won't listen to what I have to say. But God says to us like Jeremiah, I am with you to deliver you. That God goes with you and God uses you. Are you willing? Then when we we walk into this prophetic mission, when we walk into our calling and simply speak that God promises to act. At the end of the day, all of our excuses reveal unbelief. It's unbelief. I mean, God promises to give you the words to speak. In the book of Matthew, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's saying, there's going to be a day that you're going to be called to account about me. And you're going to be dragged before powerful people. I do not want you to be afraid, nor do I want you to think about what you're going to say before you go. Just go and represent me. And this is what he says. When they deliver you over... Do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it's not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That means when we allow God to move through us, God will act. God promises that his words will not be spoken in vain. That means he is responsible for the outcome. Hear that. 
God is responsible for the outcome. He promises to protect you. He promises to fulfill the desires of your heart when you delight in him and by extension, the calling on your life. That means when we step out in faith and we trust God that we are going to find things, blessings, and joy that we've never had before, that we've never seen before. We just need to step out in faith and trust God to use our imperfect attempts to obey him well. Many times, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but many times I've come up here to preach. I have my notes. I know exactly what I said. And and I'm pretty here when I'm preaching. I'm not zoned out. People have come up to me after the service and said, when you said X, Y, and Z, God used it to change my heart. God did something. The problem is I never said X, Y, and Z. I know I didn't. When we are willing to simply get up and speak, when we are just simply willing to sit down and have a conversation with somebody, when those spiritual moments pop up and God says, now, now's your time. When we're willing to speak our experience, when we're willing to speak the truth of the Lord, we can trust that God is going to use it, however imperfect, to affect his kingdom, the heart of the one listening. He tells Jeremiah, just go. Just speak, just trust. And that's exactly what he's telling us 2,500 years later. When we truly embrace God's love for us, all this comes naturally, more easily. It stems from a changed heart. 1 John 4 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. When we embrace and understand God's love for us, the fear in our life is pushed out. When we make, of course, evangelism and mission about obligation, duty, and guilt severed from God's love and grace shown to us first, it loses its joy at best and it's dangerous at worst. How many times have we heard, maybe you're guilty of it, I'm guilty of it, of preaching to somebody because we want an outcome. And so we force it. What is supposed to be done in love and humility is done with anger and convincing words. We can put all of that down. Whether or not somebody is transformed, is changed, is saved, called into the kingdom of God, while of course we desire it is not on us, So let's stop trying to make it happen. Let's trust the Lord to do what he has said that he will do. Use us as instruments of his grace. When we understand God's love and it motivates us, something different happens. 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul says, For the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say compels us. It's this inward propelling, this propulsion forward. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Paul is saying, I realize because of God's love for us, for me, that there's nothing that I can do that I am dead, that it is Christ in me and it's his love that propels me forward. We relinquish the desire to control outcomes and simply speak the truth in love. This is how we reach the nations. You know, in Corinth, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians where there's falling into sectarianism. They're saying, well, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul. Paul says, it doesn't matter who it is. Ultimately, God, we're just tools that God uses. That it's God who gives the growth. When we're motivated by God's love for us and we trust that God is simply using us as a part of his plan and we trust that God is the one who gives the increase, We can do all of this with joy and not fear. Look what finally God says to Jeremiah in verse 9. He says, 
Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I've set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overflow, to build and to plant. Wow, that's quite a job description. Jeremiah's calling as a prophet of God had implications that went far beyond what you and I would consider our day-to-day issues. But God empowered him with authority to speak God's word and declare God's will to nations and to kingdoms. And you might be thinking, well, I was, I was tracking you on this point, up to this point, with how to, our calling as believers parallels Jeremiah's as a prophet, but I'm not plucking up and destroying nations but you should know. You have tremendous authority, responsibility, and impact in your prophetic mission to the nations. We've seen examples of it. Rich talked about it. Someone comes here, international student, they interact with a Christian who just loves them well and does what Christians do well, reflect the love of Christ, and they're willing to speak when the opportunity comes, should the opportunity come, and they go back to a nation. Think about the president of China, had he been evangelized, who knows what would have happened? We have authority. While this authority we wield is not ours, we're commanded to take dominion over the creation, to work in the power of the Spirit, to act as God's agents in building his kingdom. Our mission here matters, it has eternal consequences. Those conversations that we're in, those little day-to-day things, those little coffee times and tea times, those phone calls, they matter. We don't know what God is going to do in these moments. As far as authority, we too have authority to overthrow those spiritual forces in the name of Christ for Christ's kingdom. The Great Commission begins with, Behold, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is saying, it's all mine, now I send you. Look what God says to Jeremiah, I put my words in your mouth. We speak God's words, not our own, as messengers of the gospel when we declare the things of truth, the truth of God. We do so with authority because it's ultimately God's word. Have you ever been interacting with somebody and knew that you needed to say something uncomfortable? But in so doing, and you knew it was God's will, but in so doing, it felt like you were the one telling them the bad news instead of saying, God says. Let me tell you, there's great freedom in saying, you know, God says. And not, you know, I think. God says. Responsibility. There's great responsibility to be called to speak the very words of God. What we say matters. Jeremiah was chosen as a prophet and eternally saved by grace. Like him, we didn't do anything to be saved. God saved us of his own sovereign will to walk with him and partner with him in the greatest act of God since creation. You're part of that. We're part of this. Are you ready? God uses his word in our mouths to call people into his eternal family. God has chosen to save people using this message through the preaching of the gospel through his people, Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Paul's saying they won't. And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But we have a choice. We can step into our God-given prophetic calling. We can go on business as usual. Never realizing what God is waiting to do through us. Never realizing what God has created us for. You don't know the impact that you might have. The lives that we touch with the gospel are eternally impacted whether we realize it or not. Sometimes we're just planting seeds like the passage says. Sometimes we're watering. Ultimately, it's God who gives the growth. We never know what's going to happen. One of my favorite movies, I had been reminded recently about it. I had sort of forgotten about it. It was a movie called Mr. Holland's Opus. Mr. Holland was a jazz musician who wanted to write the greatest piece 
of American symphonic music ever. In the 60s, he set out to do it, and then he realized the, the starving artist thing is real. So he falls back by getting a teaching certificate and begins to teach music at a local high school. And, this, and the movie is about all of the lives he's touched throughout the year. You know, I have different kids he interact with. You know, you got the pothead. He's, he's yelling at him about it. And then he goes off to the military. You got a good kid who plays football, goes to Vietnam and ends up dying. You got a girl who just can't get the clarinet part right. And all of those day-to-day -day interactions that he has with these kids. Move into like the 80s and 90s, and they're needing to cut costs, budget cuts, you know. And what goes? The art and music program. Mr. Holland thinks my whole life has been a waste. Here I was supposed to be the America's greatest composer, and now I'm a washed-up teacher, 60 years old, and I got five years left till I can retire. What am I going to do? And he feels defeated. He's packing up his last day of work, and he's walking out with his wife and his son, and as they are leaving, he hears music. He goes, now what is, what is that? What is going on? And they hear it from the auditorium. He opens the door, and there's hundreds of pre previous students there playing and cheering. And a big banner across the stage that says, thank you, Mr. Holland. And as he walks in, he's meeting students along the way who he's known throughout the years. And they usher him to the front, and he sits down, and he realizes that his life mattered. He realizes that all of his work was not for nothing, that the little interactions here and there with students throughout the years changed them. Now, I don't know about you, we always talk about the we want to hear the well done, good and faithful servant, right? It's that moment that I believe we walk into heaven, we're going to see the impact. We're going to see the receiving celebration when we walk through those doors that say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we get to see the people and the lives that we've touched. We can't know that it's going to happen now. We don't know the impact that we have now, but we will one day. God has promised it. If we simply speak, simply speak. You cannot foreknow what will happen with the people who hear the gospel in your life through you, through your deeds, but God knows. You never know how God's word on your lips spoken at just the right time maybe even just the wrong time, will have an impact. It will melt an icy heart, plant a seed, nurture a tender shoot that bears lifelong fruit, changing the world. But you got to choose. Make the choice because you have a God-ordained prophetic mission to reach the nations. Trust God in that, not your prowess in living out your God-ordained prophetic mission to the nations. Because you have been given tremendous authority, responsibility, and one day impact that you'll see in your prophetic mission to the nations all around us. I mean, look around you. The fields are ripe for harvest. Reach out, take a chance, embrace people with Christ's love, befriend somebody, and watch what happens when God's power is released through you into the lives of others with eternal consequences. Are you ready? The nations to which we have been called are right here at our door. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would do a work in our hearts, Lord. We know that you have a plan. We read of your plan. We know it. We, we embrace it. We know that Christ was sent on our behalf, Father. Forgive us where we've received but not given back. Forgive us where we've kept our salvation to ourselves, kept your word to ourselves, even hidden in our heart, not allowing it to come out. Lord, give us opportunities. Give us grace. Lord, as a church and as individuals, show us a way forward that we can better reflect your love through word and deed to those around us, even to the nations all around us. Forgive us, Lord, where we've been afraid. 
or we see someone in a, a hijab or a burqa, or we see someone of a different color, or we see someone who looks different or has different values, Lord, forgive us. Help us, Lord, to love well and speak the truth when you've given us the opportunity, trusting you for the consequences. Lord, we pray that we leave this place different than when we came and that that change would be lasting and that we would be looking to your love is that which compels us and nothing more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can stay seated for this first song. Countless souls in darkness bound Wonder and grief and pain who will go and seek them out and lead them back home again? Here I am, Lord, send me. And if your will means a cross, to heal and redeem all the lost, I will go, send me. Lord, I confess I've lived to serve mere idols of wood and clay. Oh, send your grace and teach my heart to rise up each morning and say, Here I am, Lord, send me. And if your will means a cross to heal and redeem all the lost, I will go, send me. Once our God foresaw the fall And how far our sin would spread Grieved, he cried, how can we save them all? And Christ knelt before him and said send me and if your will means a cross to heal and redeem all the lost I will go send me here I am Lord send me and if your will means a cross to heal and redeem all the lost, I will go, send me. You guys can stand for this last one. Come set your rule and reign inside our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church And we need your power in us Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for you're our joy and prize, to see the captive hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor, the peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's God. church and we pray revive this earth.
unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. Your force of help and star, your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of And we are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on. Awesome. Okay. I got thrown off. What a way to leave. God wants to build his kingdom through you. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you would use us as instruments of your grace. Open our mouths, Lord, when it needs to be open. Move our fear out. Give us courage, Lord, to love and live like Christ to the nations who are all around us. We thank you, Lord, for this day. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you and go in peace.